All right, take out your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We continue our study in Ephesians chapter 6. And we've been uh, talking about this, this principle of submission that, that God calls husbands and wives in their marriage to, to mutually submit to each other. Uh, God calls children to obey their parents and, and parents to raise their children in the Lord. And now we come to this topic about slaves and masters. The relationship between slaves and masters. Now, when we hear the term slavery, we immediately have a negative connotation, right? Yep. Slavery. We, we think about slavery in our country or, or the new world. And we think about shackles and, and whips and the degradation of, of <clears throat> human beings. I and mean, we've all seen the movies. We've all read, read the stories about how the, the African people were degraded and the horrible things that happened uh, in our country during that period. Not only in our country, but in England, in Europe, in France, uh, all around the world. Um, we know about that story. So this morning, we come to Ephesians chapter 6, and we see this topic on slavery again. And so I want to just kind of give us a little bit of a backdrop. I want to give us some understanding about slavery in the first century. Uh, I discovered this quote uh, from the Zondervan Illustrated Commentary, and I thought it provided some interesting information about slavery. It says, there is no evidence in ancient literature of a slave rebellion with the abolition of slavery as its goal. It's interesting. Why? Not only was Roman era slavery a non-racial institution, uh, there were slaves of all races, <coughs> but most slaves could, be reasonably, could reasonably expect emancipation by the time they reached 30 years of age. Nor was the work of a slave limited to hard labor. Slaves work in a variety of different occupations, including household management, a teaching and business, and many even owned property. <coughs> because of the poverty of many free laborers, the economic and living conditions of slaves were often far better. This led many free laborers to sell themselves into slavery as a means of economic advancement. This is not to deny that slavery was essentially an ungodly structure, that deprived a person of freedom and dignity, it is simply to affirm that Roman era slavery did not share all of the same features of New World slavery that would ignite a rebellion. So interesting, some interesting information uh, about slavery uh, in the first century Roman Empire. Uh, it's going to be interesting to note that there were Christians who had slaves. And so when I look at slavery in the New Testament, I kind of see it in the category of divorce and polygamy. It's not something that God licensed, right? It's something that came about because of the hard heart of humans, the sinfulness of humans. But we do see that it is something that God permitted in the first century. Now, there's something else I want to say about that. Because I do believe the teaching of the church led to the demise of slavery. You say, what do you mean about that? The teaching of the church that, that God has created everybody in the image of God Nobody's any better than anybody else. We're all created in the image of God. Jesus said that the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. But not only that, we are called even to prefer people over ourselves. So I believe that the teaching of the church ultimately led to the demise of slavery. 
And we even see Christians like William Wilberforce in England. There's a great movie called Amazing Grace. Anybody seen that movie? Yeah, some of you. If you haven't, you need to see it. Powerful movie uh, about William Wilberforce. He was a politician in England. And, and God used him to bring about the, the end of slavery. Of course, in our own country, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the daughter of a pastor, uh, and she was a part of, of Indian, Indian slavery in our own country. So God used Christians to really lead the movement to end slavery. But the context of our passage this morning is the first century. And that was a different time. And as we read, it was, it was a different context. So I just wanted you to understand that a little bit as we come to this passage. We're going to go ahead and read the passage in just a minute. And what I want you to notice as we read the passage is how does... Paul communicate to the Ephesians how slaves and masters are to relate to each other. Let's go ahead and stand together. And you can see the passage up on the, on the PowerPoint there. So Paul says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, Treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. Would you pray with me? God, I, I just pray for our time together today. Lord, as we, we look at this difficult passage, and I, I pray that, Lord, you would speak to each one of us as we look at our own context. Uh, we don't live in a, a world where, where slavery is a part of our economic reality anymore, Lord. But we do have jobs. And we do have employers. And some of us are employers. So, God, I, I pray today that, that you would just speak to us as we look at this passage, God, that you would help us to to see the things that we need to see. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so in this passage, Paul gives some clear directives, right? About how slaves are to relate to their masters and how masters are to relate to their slaves. And as I said in my prayer... We don't live in a country that practices slavery anymore, right? Slavery is still happening around the world. Uh, and if you lived in parts of China or Indonesia, other places, you might read this different. But, but in our context, we don't live in a country where slavery is practiced. So the question is, how does this apply to us? Well, we all have employers, right? Some of us are employers. Some of us are supervisors. So I think there's some really good principles that, that we can learn, that we can apply to, to how we relate to each other in the workplace. So the question that we're going to look at today is, how should we relate to each other in our occupational world? There's an outline in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. Here's the first thing. That we see subordinates should obey their supervisors as if working for the Lord, who will hold everyone accountable. We should serve our employers with diligence because God will ultimately judge us for our conduct. <clears throat> Paul says, first of all, Right there in verse 5, he says, 
<coughs> Slaves, <coughs> obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. Now the Greek word for obey is the same word that Paul used back in verse 1 when he told children to obey their parents. Christian slaves were to obey their earthly masters. Now we all have a heavenly master in heaven, right? Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are called to obey him. But Paul says, slaves, obey your masters. And he says to do this with respect and fear. And respect is the same word we see back in chapter 5, verse 21 and 33. It's the word phobos, which means fear, terror, and reverence. So I believe that what Paul is saying here is more the idea of reverence. We are to respect. We are to obey our masters with reverence. The word translated fear is the word tromos, which literally is trembling. So we are to obey with fear and trembling. Now I think that's an interesting idea, to obey with fear and trembling. One of the reasons why I think that Paul uses these words is because, let's be honest, it's hard, right? I mean, it's hard to obey. This is not easy stuff. I mean, you've got to look at the context of, of, of this letter. These were slaves in the first century. This was not easy stuff. I like what the speaker up at the men's retreat said this year in talking about Philippians 2, which is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Literally, what he was saying is that when we look at what God is doing and we come into his presence... And the presence of God, we should have fear. We should have reverence for that. I mean, this is a high calling. The command continues the theme of this section, right? He's talked about wives submitting to your husbands. He's talked about children obeying your parents. This is something that we can't do without God's help. We need God's help. And there is no way that a slave was going to be able to obey his or her master without God's help. He goes on to say that they should obey with sincerity of heart as you would obey Christ. Obey with sincerity of heart as you would obey Christ. Now Paul gives details of what their obedience should look like. They should obey with sincerity of heart as they obey Christ. Now we all know the difference between going through the motions and doing something with all your heart, right? I was thinking about when I was a kid. And my mom gave me the job of cleaning the bathroom. How many of you had the chore of cleaning the bathroom? I'm just curious to know. Yeah. I hated cleaning the bathroom. Any other job I would rather do. But please, mom, don't give me the chore of cleaning the bathroom. So I would go in there and I would come up with a scheme, right? <clears throat> How could I make the bathroom look clean without touching the toilet? <laughs> My mind was spinning. You know, and I and I take a rag and I and I would kind of wipe everything down where I saw, you know, any dust or anything, and I'd fix the towels, and then I'd say, hey mom, the bathroom's clean. But the bathroom wasn't clean, right? I never even touched the cleanser or the toilet brush. It never even got wet. But you know what? Several years later, when I got married, and Vanessa said, Toby, can you clean the bathroom? <laughs> okay. 
you know what? When my wife asked me to do it, I had a different motivation about it. Right? We, we were in our first year of marriage. I wanted to do it the best as I can because I wanted to please her. I wanted her to be happy with me. See, the first example is I was going through the motions. I was pretending. But the second example is I was doing it with sincerity of heart. Paul is going to go on in Colossians 3.23. It's a parallel passage. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters. This, this letter was again written to believers in Colossae. It was also written to slaves and masters. Paul says, hey guys, slaves, whatever you do, do it with all your heart. As if you're working for the Lord. Because he is your master. You're not really doing it for that guy over there. You're actually doing it for the Lord. So do it with all your heart. Paul says that we are slaves of Christ. Back to Ephesians. He says, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Now, some of you hear that idea, slaves of Christ? Boy, that doesn't sound very egalitarian. That doesn't sound good. But we see that throughout the Bible. Even Jesus' own brother James, in the opening of his letter, calls himself a bond servant of Christ. A bond servant of Jesus. Now, I'll tell you what, I have two brothers. And one thing you will never hear me say is that I am a servant of my brothers. No way. But James, he calls himself a bond servant, a slave of Christ. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22 to 23, Paul is talking about this, this topic of, of slavery. He says, For the one who is a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, the one who is free when called is Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Paul says, guys, if you were a slave when Christ called you, guess what? Though physically you might still be in bondage, you are no longer a slave. You are free. Because Christ is now your master. But if you are free when Jesus called you, and in all of us, that is our context. He says, guess what? You have been bought at a price. You are now slaves of Christ. Your life, it doesn't belong to you anymore. You belong to Jesus. And if Jesus is your master, then your life should be about pleasing him. Your, your life should be about doing his will. Those things that, that make you uncomfortable, those things you don't want to do, like cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> Guys, I'm talking to you. <laughs> if Jesus calls you to do it, then do it. Because he is your master. And you should do it with sincerity of heart. Paul says again, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. He says, guys, you are serving the Lord. Verse 8, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether slave or free. 
Now this verse is very important. Right? We serve a God that rewards his people for their faithfulness. Amen? God rewards his people for their faithfulness. Look at Psalm 62, 12. The writer says, And with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they've done. Now, this would have been of utmost importance for these slaves, right? I mean, because let's face it, <clears throat> they had a hard situation. They were slaves. They belonged to another person. They didn't have the freedom to do what they wanted to do. They had to do what their master told them to do. So it was very important for them to understand that when they were serving God, when they were doing the right thing, God was going to reward them. And that reward, it may come in this life. It doesn't always Sometimes we are rewarded in this life. Maybe they were promoted to a higher position. Maybe they got a raise. Maybe they were even emancipated and given freedom. But maybe their reward was not in this life. Maybe their reward was to come into the presence of Jesus. And have him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Wow. Is there, a, is there a, a reward that's even better than that? Nothing. It's the greatest reward ever to have Jesus say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Paul says this reality, it applies whether you're a slave or whether you're free. <clears throat> so here we go. In the 21st century, this applies to us, right? Because we're not slaves, we're free. None of us are owned by another person. None of us have a, have a contract. We don't we don't have a, a, a tattoo or we have a, a ring that says we belong to another human. We're free. But we do have earthly masters, don't we? Some of us have employers. Some of us are employees. Some of us, let's just be honest, we have jobs we go to on a daily basis and we hate our job. Some of us might even despise our employer. Maybe you're an employer and you despise your employees. I shared a couple weeks ago about working in the hotel industry in Seattle. And the bosses I work for, boy, Vanessa, every day, talk about a saint, she had to hear me complain about my job. And grumble about it. And some of us, we work for difficult bosses. Difficult supervisors. But the words that the Lord spoke through Paul in the first century, they apply just as much to us. And we are called to obey the bosses <laughs> or supervisors God has placed over us. And, and we are to work wholeheartedly for them. Not just go through the motions. Don't pretend that you're doing the job. Do the job with all of your heart. And even have reverence for them. Wow. Man. Some of us, when we think about having reverence for our bosses, just the idea makes us cringe. Pastor, you don't know my boss. I don't. But remember, who are you working for? Are you working for that guy or gal? Or are you working for Jesus? Jesus. 
your master. You are working for Jesus. And when we comprehend this, it will change our whole attitude about work. I mean, literally, it just changes everything. Next, Paul turns to masters or employers. Look at verse 9. He says, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. The next point that we see is that employers are to treat their employees in a way that would please Jesus, their master. Mm -hmm. Employers also have to treat their employees with sincerity of heart, with reverence. Because guess what? Jesus is also their master. He's the one that they serve. Paul says, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Now, as I said earlier, in the first century, there were Christian slave owners. Now, the letter of Philemon, later in the New Testament, is written to a prominent church leader who owned slaves. Again, this was a cultural thing. God didn't license it, but he did allow it. But Paul makes a revolutionary statement by not just focusing on the conduct of slaves, but now focusing on the conduct of their masters. He says, guess what, guys? i got something to say to you also. He says, treat your slaves in the same way. You mean the same command Paul gives to the slaves applies to the slave owners? Absolutely. That, that's absolutely what he's saying. As I said a moment ago, they need to be reverential and, and sincere in how they relate to their slaves. They need to know when they treat their slaves in a respectful manner, they are actually serving Jesus as their Lord. Next, Paul gives an example of what this looks like. He says, do not threaten them. Now we know, going all the way back to Moses and the Israelites, it was very common for slave owners to threaten their slaves. Right? Remember the story back in, in Exodus with the Egyptians? And throughout the history, slave owners had threatened their slaves with whippings, with uh, holding off rations and food, even with death. And that was very common. And even in the first century, a slave was considered property. But Paul says, for you, Christian slave owners, this is not appropriate. It is not appropriate for you to threaten your slaves. <clears throat> they were not to use threats. Just a moment ago, I, I talked about the, the book of Philemon. And as I said, the book of Philemon was written to a Christian slave owner in Colossa. And here's what happened. Philemon had a slave by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus was able to get away he was a runaway slave. And that was a big deal in the Roman Empire. If you were a runaway slave and you were captured, the punishment was capital punishment. It was death. But somehow, Onesimus came into contact with the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. And Paul had a chance to lead Onesimus to Christ. He became a believer. And Paul discipled him. And a part of that discipleship was Paul saying, Onesimus, 
you need to go back to Colossae and you need to make things right with Philemon. And so Paul writes this letter to Philemon asking for him to have mercy. That's what he says. He says, Philemon, perhaps the reason he was separated from you was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. I love that. St. Philemon, this guy, he's not just property. He's a person. But not only is he a person, but he's now a brother in Christ. And you should receive him back with mercy. And recognize that, that his greater value is not that he can do this job for you, that he can do these tasks. His greater value is that he is now a brother in Christ. And as a brother in Christ, you should love him. You should have reverence for him. Masters, do not threaten your slaves. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians. He says, do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. He said, wake up, guys. You may be their earthly master, but their master and yours is God. You both are servants of God. And so you need to love them. You need to respect them. He says, whether you're a slave or a slave owner, your master's in heaven, he's the one that you should be serving. And guess what? There's no favoritism with God. He loves you both the same. You both have equal value to him. And because he loves you both the same, he will hold you accountable for your actions. If you don't show reverence towards your slaves, he, as your heavenly master, will hold you accountable. Friends, again, in the 21st century, this has application for us, doesn't it? For our occupational world, for the world that we live in. It has powerful application for us who are put in places of authority over others. We must make sure we're leading our employees in a sincere and respectful manner. Truly caring for their well-being. Hey, if God has given you the, the humble responsibility of, of overseeing employees, maybe you own your own business. Wow, that's sacred. That's a high calling. You better make sure that you are treating your employees with respect. You better make sure that you are showing reverence towards them. And don't threaten them. Now, I, I get it. There are times when you are in a, a supervisor position and when you have employees... And sometimes, after warning after warning, they just don't do what you ask them to. And I get it. There are times you have to punish them. But listen to this. Remember who your master is. Remember the grace that God has had in your life. And make sure that your punishment is always fair. And make sure it's always appropriate. Because your master is the Lord. 
Friends, when we relate to our employees in a respectful manner, it's for the Lord. And it brings Him glory. Boy, I'll tell you what. We've all worked for bad bosses, right? We all have. But wow, wouldn't it be amazing if God had had put you in that position of authority? And, and, And through the way you relate to your employees, your employees say, wow, what is it about him or her? There's just something different about them. And they come to you and they ask you and they say, what is it? What is different about you? And that gives you an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. What Jesus has done in your life. It gives you the opportunity to give glory to God. Now friends, I, I, I understand this is tough stuff. This is not easy. I recognize that work relationships can be very difficult. And so I come back to the key verse of this whole section. And the key verse, right, is Ephesians 5.21, which says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We choose to be obedient to what God calls us to do out of our reverence for Christ. And boy, I'll tell you what, I've said this before, if you don't have this relationship in order, then this relationship is going to be a mess. You've got to get this relationship right. And if you have this relationship right, then then God is going to help you. He's going to give you the strength that you need to be a good employee and to be a good employer. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your word. Um, This passage written over 2,000 years ago still has strong application to us today. And and Lord, we we recognize how much we need your help. Lord, when when we see what it is that you call us to in Scripture, we are filled with fear and trembling because it's not easy. It's a high calling. And yet, Lord, thank you that your word says in Matthew 11, 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself because I am gentle and humble at heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Lord, thank you that, that we can yoke ourselves together with you. And Lord, when we are yoked together with you in your power and in your strength, we can do anything. Anything you call us to do. So God, help us to remember that. And help us to remember how much we need you. That without you, we are truly lost. I just pray for my brothers and sisters as they head out this week as they go to their places of employment, uh, some of them are going to school, and this applies to them also. God, I I just pray that that you would help them to be obedient to what you've called them to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.